so there are many things to to I was trying, but I, I cannot find it. <laughs> I was trying not to. Yeah, we can leave the uh, one. <laughs> Okay, good morning, everyone. So welcome and thank you very much for, for coming. So today we have the, well, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Tony Cavalla. So Tony Cavalla, he's a, a scientist from Croatia, originally from Croatia. Uh, he made his PhD in Zagreb University, right? And then after that, he moved to, to the US, to Brookhaven National Lab, where he spent most of his scientific career. So we are fortunate enough to have him on a DIPC after a couple of years that he, he arrived here. So he's an expert in, I would say, in, in photo emission techniques, in particular in synchrotron uh, radiation. He has been an experimental working in, in photo emission based techniques uh, for uh, most of his life or all his scientific life, I think. So uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, Tony, just to, to show your, let's say, your uh, scientific expertise to our local community. And thank you very much for, let's say, for coming here to San Sebastian and also for accepting to deliver this seminar to present your work. Thank you very much. For inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to work here. Uh, so uh, today, uh, my just okay. okay. So my main objective is not to answer this question, but uh, okay. my main goal is actually to for you to uh, learn something about uh, angular result photomission, if you are not already an expert, to learn something about uh, this uh, very uh, powerful experimental technique that could actually uh, attack questions like, like uh, the, this. Uh, the outline of my talk is like this, so I'm gonna introduce give you a brief introduction to uh, high TC's problem. And then I'm going to describe how RPS can uh, uh, give you information about ele electron form coupling or any other coupling mechanism and what RPS can do uh, in, in modern uh, solid state systems. And then I'm going to present my results that are related to the uh, title on one specific uh, coup rate, BISCO2212. And I will show you that uh, essentially ARPES can give you uh, answers to the coupling uh, mechanism that was not uh, you know, solved for a long, long time. And if I have time, I will uh, present some other quantum materials and uh, I will, since there is a strong initiative here to, to actually build uh, a very uh, state-of-the-art state of the art uh, ARPES lab, uh, I will uh, give you some of my ideas what, what could be done at that place. So ARPES is actually a connection of ARPES and uh, uh, high TCs is kind of symbiotic one. So, oops, it's a beautiful example of what happens if you have a big problem, then instead of just solving this problem with, with uh, you know, <laughs> what you have at the moment, you also end up 
developing uh, the tool to, to, to better understand and to solve the problem. So that was a really beautiful uh, symbiotic case of ARPES and uh, IPCs where one problem actually helped the other. And uh, ARPES is now at the state where it can uh, attack uh, very complicated problems in, in solid state physics. So here is just a very short uh, one slide introduction of, uh, of uh, I, what I, this is what I uh, presented maybe 20 years ago. Uh, nothing much changed except that the number of papers that are now published is not 10 to 20 per day. It's actually two, two orders of magnitude less, but this is still one of the most studied problems in science in general, because you already have a few hundred thousand uh, papers that published on, on that problem. And uh, we still don't understand it uh, completely. Uh, but this is not actually surprising because, uh, you know, uh, conventional superconductivity was discovered in 1911, as soon as uh, liquefaction of helium uh, become became available and uh, as you know uh, superconductivity is a state of no resistivity and you have also complete expulsion of magnetic field and uh, it took actually almost 50 years to completely understand that problem the first uh, clue was that uh, you know uh, that uh, isotope effect where uh, you see that TC is actually uh, different for different isotopes. Uh, and that led Froelich to, you know, to show that there is a Hamiltonian where electrons can be attracted once uh, in, in the pairs by, by uh, you know, uh, exchanging uh, virtual phon phonons. Uh, high TCs are completely different uh, from, from uh, conventional uh, simple superconductors. So their parent compounds are not even uh, metals. They're anti-ferromagnetic moth insulators. So the electronic interactions in these materials when not doped are so strong that uh, uh, electrons are actually localized to, to, to the side because double occupancy is forbidden because of strong colon repulsion. And you end up, instead of having perfectly half filled metal, you end up with uh, having an insulator. And it's only when, when you drop extra holes or extra electrons in this, this uh, antiparamagnetic moth insulator is that when you get conductivity and superconductivity. So normal state is very complicated. It's not Fermi liquid, at least uh, close to, 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 to half filling. But at certain point, you get superconductivity. It follows a dome-like uh, structure as a function of doping. And at this side, it becomes more conventional and even normal state becomes very conventional Fermi liquid. However, coupling mechanism, so mechanism that gives you superconductivity in these materials is still unknown. And uh, it's already more than 35 years from discovery and we still uh, don't know exact uh, mechanism. So how uh, photo emission can help? Okay, so photo emission is essentially very simple technique. You shine your sample with monochromatic light and that has enough energy to eject electrons from material into vacuum. And then you collect these electrons, you detect, and you, you, know, you look at their distribution as a function of, of kinetic energy as, and as a function of, of uh, emission angle, 
and based on uh, energy and momentum conservation laws, you can recreate the energy and momentum of the hole that you created that is left in the system. And that hole is actually fundamental excitation of the ground state that you study. This is something that uh, theorists like to calculate first. Uh, and uh, But actually, uh, ARPES was for a long, long time just used to, you know, to to check how good band structure calculations were. So, uh, essentially just checking what theory uh, was predicting. But as I already mentioned, we have, we have a technique that actually gives you a spectral function of the photo hole that is created in the system. And that, Spectral function actually already in, uh, uh, involves uh, self energy. It involves interactions in the system. So when your hole is created, it doesn't live there forever. It, it doesn't stay in the state that you created it. It can re interact with everything in, else in the system. It can be phonons, it can be uh, impurities. It will change its state. And this is. This is how you get these interactions. Uh, you, it involves self-energy. So imaginary part and real part, this affects the, the width of the state that you're measuring. And this real part of the self-energy affects the energy of the state itself. So essentially we, we are measuring imaginary part of the Green's function that in, in, involves interactions. So why then uh, photo emission was actually used only for band structure to, to compare uh, experiment with band structure calculations? Well, it was not easy to, to, you know, to detect these sometimes small effects. So this is a copy of uh, one illustration in Ashcroft memory textbook. And this particular case is related to electron phonon coupling. So you have uh, electronic state, parabolic state, certain mass, and then very close to the Fermi level and Fermi momentum, you have an effect like this. So this was actually calculated almost uh, in late 50s, but it was never observed. Uh, in, in the experiment directly. And uh, by comparing these you know, energies and momenta, you can see that this actually happens very close. So within the uh, phonon energy range uh, relative to the Fermi level. And so if you're measuring the electronic band, which can be few electron volts, and if you have all type of the analyzer where you just uh, detect uh, the state by rotating the sample in steps of one degree, you will not see that because you don't have energy resolution and you don't have, especially you don't have momentum resolution. So the main problem why uh, ARPES was used for a long time just to measure electronic structure and compare it to band structure calculations was that it, it wasn't ready for, for measuring and detecting uh, fine effects like this. So you needed some kind of, of revolution of, of this uh, simple technique in order to, to attack uh, more serious problems. So as I said, early uh, all type uh, analyzers. So, so this is your sample, this is your light. There is a, a electron, electrostatic uh, lens. And then there is a entrance split, hemispherical anal analyzer, and you have a detector. So this is negatively charged, this is positively charged. 
and you you know, have electrons that follow some uh, curved uh, trajectories, and uh, depending on their kinetic energy, uh, the position uh, is in this direction. If if the energy is higher, it's going to appear here. If the energy is lower, it's going to. So you have a system that actually serves as a, a, a spectrometer of, of electronic energies. And now if you just detect a single point, you have to rotate the sample to, to get the complete picture. But that was usually done in steps of one or two degrees or half a degree at best. And uh, 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 I can uh, tell you that I'm really proud that I was in the group that uh, first uh, obtained these two dimensional images. So instead of single point detection, we used uh, two dimensional detection, which allows you to get electrons within certain angular range and within certain energy. And uh, essentially uh, in that way, you could monitor your, your band structure uh, live you know, on the screen. So you could see pictures like this instantly. And if you rotate your sample, this picture would move left and right. And, uh, uh, but now you see, instead of uh, having, I don't know, three or, or six or maybe even 10 points on this band structure, I now have maybe 1,000 pixels and in energy too. So I have one megapixel instead of single pixel uh, that uh, the uh, sing single, detect sing single point detection would uh, give you. So this was our first contribution and uh, we had a head start of maybe a year and a half uh, compared to other groups. The second uh, revolution is essentially uh, my idea uh, and it's very important when you want to study very, very small or very inhomogeneous samples. And at the same time, you have very uh, small spot, photon spot that allows you to study different regions of, of the sample. And you, uh, you realize that if you have to rotate the sample and, and, and you have a light coming on the sample, if you want to study the same point, it's gonna be very difficult. So is there a way that, that we could uh, uh, avoid rotation? The other, the other thing would be to rotate the analyzer, but this, this thing is, is 200 kilos or more. So uh, the fact is that this is cylindrical lens. So you actually collect some solid angle that is cylindrical and symmetric. And it's only the slit of the hemisphere that selects one direction in, in, in momentum space that is, is uh, detected and, and on, on, on the two-dimensional detection uh, detector. But in principle, you could add, uh, so these are electrons. You could add deflector inside and move the whole solid angle of electrons so that only that different, different uh, angles are selected to this slate. And that would be equivalent of rotating your sample. And actually, uh, when we were building and, and designing Beamline at NSLS2 that had one micron spot size and it was specifically designed to study small samples, uh, we asked, actually, I asked uh, Sienta whether they could retrofit our analyzer with, with, with deflectors. They said, oh, no, it's very difficult. Uh, and surely enough, uh, two years later, I get the brochure <laughs> essentially uh, offering me uh, this modern uh, deflector analyzer that, that actually had these deflectors. In the meantime, I, I, you know, they, they had deflectors already in the first, 
first their first detector first analyzers just to correct for some uh, uh, mechanical misalignments and I was able to show that they can serve actually to produce complete uh, case space mapping without rotate, rotating the sample this is one sample and you can see that when you rotating you get from one flake to another so it's 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 a messy situation but when you apply when you sit on the same sample without rotating the analyzer and when you do deflection you can produce the same and it, it's much cleaner okay so now uh photo emission as at the state where it can attack some serious uh, problems and immediately you can see that you know a lot of materials show uh, this this kink that is similar to to what what you have in uh, Ashcroft Mermin textbooks <clears throat> and uh, so back to the uh, question of high TCs uh, we can ask whether ARPES is now actually the technique that can provide a smoking gun uh, proof one way or the other for different mechanisms just as uh, planar tunneling was was the uh, smoking gun experiment to 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 verify BCS uh, theory so planar tunneling detected the gap and also uh, these structures that showed that there is coupling to phonons and that was essentially everything that that uh, that was in line with BCS theory so ARPES could do the same and actually much more because we are momentum resolve technique so we can sit at any point tunneling uh, is momentum average technique. So every point on the Fermi surface can contribute to, to tunneling, tunneling just as, as it can contribute to transport. But photo emission is specific because you can sit at any point on the Fermi surface and see how the self energy or the gap depends on momentum. So we are momentum result technique. And this is crucial for anisotropic materials. And most of materials are nowadays are anisotropic. Uh, so let me just briefly show you how we can uh, detect, for example, electron phonon coupling. Uh, it doesn't have to be phonon, it can be any boson, it can be magnon, it can be uh, exciton or whatever. Uh, so essentially, this is how how the process goes. So you have, you create a photo hole in, in one state and it can emit or absorb some other excitation. And then based on, on, on conservation laws, it has to go to the other state. So the simplest case, uh, let's forget about K. Let's just see the energy consideration. So if I create the electron, uh, the hole, so if I have electronic band, and if I have just a single phonon, nothing else, just a single phonon that doesn't disperse, Einstein-like mode, then this hole cannot do this. It cannot emit uh, this excitation. Why? Because it doesn't have enough energy. So uh, this hole would have to go, you know, If, if you're gonna change the energy by this much, the, the hole should go above the Fermi level, that's forbidden. So it's only when your hole reaches the energy of, of your phonon, it can emit that. It can emit that phonon, so this. And <clears throat> so if on, in the other, on the other uh, word, so this process is forbidden for all the holes within this region. So these holes are gonna stay there forever. They cannot go to an, any other state. But when I reach this, this process automatically becomes available. So my 
imaginary part of the self energy, which is essentially inverse of the lifetime, uh, is going to be a step function. It's very simple. And everything is described by, by this. At the same time, energy of, of my uh, call created is going to be also affected. It's just because of causality relationships. So Kramer's croning of imaginary part gives you a real part of the self energy. And for something like this, with, which looks like a step function, you will have a uh, singularity at the same energy. This real part of the self energy has to be added to non-interacting dispersion. So whatever you had parabola or linear dispersion, real measured uh, dispersion should be uh, affected by this, and this should be added to, to non-interacting non -interacting part. So in other words, if, if, I, if I add these two to my, you know, to my uh, dispersion and uh, width, I should have something like this. So very sharp in this region and broad in this region, and also when I add this to parabola, I get the king. And really, this is something that you see in almost every system. So actually, uh, when we measure some material, we get oops, we get the experimental uh, electronic structure. To get self energy from that, you have to go the opposite of what I showed you. So, so you extract. So how how do you extract self energy? So, you fit your intensity at different uh, energies. You start at the Fermi level and go then go deeper and deeper, and uh, you always have a peak that looks something like this. The only thing that you have to take care about is the width of this thing and the position of that thing. The width you can plot here, and the position you plot, you know, like these black lines. And then to get real part of the self energy, you just subtract some non interacting dispersion. Uh, in this particular case, this is uh, very doped. So it's essentially intercalated uh, graphite. So graphene sheets very strongly doped. So your Dirac point is not at the Fermi level, but at 1.5 PV below the Fermi level. And uh, instead of having point for the Fermi surface, you have these big uh, triangles. And uh, so for that case, uh, just a straight line is a very good approximation for my non-interacting band. And when I subtract this from, from my measured uh, dispersion, I get this. And you see it, it actually looks exactly what, what I showed in this uh, previous slide, uh, where I was, you know, hand waving uh, what should happen. Uh, and from, from, from these data, which are actually experimentally measured directly from photo emission, you can already say that, okay, my, my holes that I created interact with something that has energy of 160 milliEV. And the width of my state has a step function. Uh, the energy shows a kink and peak of that uh, corresponds to, to, to the uh, energy to the energy of the mode that my holes are interacting with. But this is not all. So, so we can extract a coupling constant. This is just uh, by definition, uh, low energy slope of the uh, real part of the self energy. And as I go around, so this is the, the specific advantage of, of photo emission, angular resolve photo emission, because we can go anywhere on the Fermi surface and see how these properties depend on, 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 on momentum. So for example, if I sit here, 
I can only say that that my coupling is much stronger than if I'm somewhere in the middle of these lines. So this is momentum resolved uh, case where I can extract uh, momentum resolved self energies from Arbus. And you can see that, for example, coupling constant changes from 0.3 to almost one, depending where you are on the Fermi surface. No other technique can give you that. But it's not always that you get very strong coupling. So for example, this is a, a few layers of, of graphene without any doping. So, so the uh, Dirac point is exactly the Fermi level, and this is the Fermi surface. It's a point. And you can already see that there is no, no, no kinks, no, no breaks in, in dispersion uh, for this case. Why is that? There certainly there are phonons at 160 milliEV that I should be able to see easily. But it looks like there is no, no, no coupling. Why? Well, because if I create a hole at proper energy, which is above 160 milliEV or 200 milliEV, this process should be allowed just from energy consideration because my hole has enough energy to emit that phonon. But still, there is nothing. Well, why? Well, it's because the finite state for, for that hole should then be at zero energy. If I'm starting at 160 milliEV, uh, emit a phonon at 160 milliEV, I should end up with the hole at zero energy. But look, it's, it's only a point. So this process, although allowed, it's very restricted. So uh, we see very weak electron phonon coupling for, for, for these cases. And actually, this is the case for most of, of these modern quantum materials like topological insulator, insulators. Uh, you see very weak uh, interactions. So, and that's why a photoemission now is coming back to the, to the original uh, purpose where it was just used for comparison of band structure calculations and, and experiments, which is unfortunate. But this is the trend. trend. Uh, so it's, it's, it's because of that. If I make Fermi surface larger, so for example, if I, if I dope my graphene, this is now graphene on iridium, uh, epi epitoxial graphene, uh, if I dope it with alkalines, I can shift my Fermi level, my Dirac point very deep, and I can get very large Fermi surface. And then this process is not restricted anymore because you have so many states there. And immediately you start seeing the uh, electron phonon coupling getting stronger and stronger. Okay, so now finally, uh, we are ready to, to, to go to high TCs. And uh, for this particular case, I really needed this, this new facility that we built at uh, Brookhaven National Lab. It's essentially a combination of uh, oxide MBE, ARPES, and STM in a single vacuum system. So in that system, you could uh, grow uh, transition metal oxides and cuprates in specific case and study these films in very powerful techniques like photoemission and STM without exposing these films to, to, to uh, uh, atmosphere. And both photoemission and STM are essentially very surface sensitive. So once when you get uh, the crystal outside or film outside, it's, it's useless. You see not your system, but you see dirt on, 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 on the surface of, of that system. In this way, you avoid uh, contaminating the surface because in vacuum, in ultra high vacuum, you can keep your surface uh, clean for a long time. Uh, 
and the oasis as a facility was designed to expand the base of, of uh, available systems for, for both STM and ARPIS. Uh, because we wanted to study not only BISCO that it's easy to cleave in vacuum, but also some other materials that is very hard or impossible to cleave. But if you grow the film inside the vacuum, then you can study them. And uh, very soon we were able to, you know, grow uh, the films and study them in, in ARPES. STM wasn't ready, maybe it was only two years after. Uh, because they had some problems. But in the meantime, we could study, and we did study many materials in, uh, in the system. So for example, LSEO, this is you know, uh, one of the first uh, materials, instead of actually the first one was LBCO, instead of strontium, they doped barium. And that was the first uh, this discovered uh, cuprate. Films doesn't films don't look as perfect as zinc crystals, but we were able to to get uh, the Fermi surface and a complete electronic structure. It doesn't look as beautiful as Bisco, but uh, it's good enough. Uh, actually, at the time when we were finishing our facility, there was a report by Tsinghua uh, University where they actually cleaved bulk bisco, bulk crystal bisco, and they grew a single, they grew a single layer of copper oxide on top of, of that uh, cleaved uh, crystal. And they measured STM and they saw, you know, something that looks like S wave. So the density of states inside the gap is essentially zero and you have two quasi-particle peaks. Uh, D wave that was supposed to be, you know, essentially it's, it's accepted symmetry of, of the gap in cuprates would have linear density of states. So instead of, of this U-like profile, you would have V-like profile. So based on that, they, they said, okay, this S-wave gap is actually an uh, intrinsic gap for cuprates. So they, they wanted to change the whole story about cuprates. So this, this was, in their view, S-wave uh, superconductivity. And since it disappeared just when we finished our facility, we wanted to check whether this was true. And, well, let me just tell you, this, this doesn't belong. So if you follow this uh, crystal structure, copper oxide <laughs> plane doesn't uh, belong to bismuth oxide plane. So you see from the bulk electronic structure, sing, uh, single crystal cleaves at this point, but copper oxide is two uh, planes away from that. So this will not grow as they thought that it would. But we also wanted to see what is actually happened, what is actually happening with, with the substrate that we want to deposit copper oxide plane. What happens to, to my single crystal when I expose it to the conditions necessary to grow the film? And conditions are really, you know, uh, it has, the temperature has to be uh, 500 Celsius, and it has to be done in uh, 10 to the minus five uh, pressure of ozone. And most materials will burn in that, in, at, at these conditions. So we just wanted to see uh, what happens with, with my BISCO single crystal when I expose it to, to these, uh, to these conditions required for the growth of, of copper oxide film on that. And what happened is, you know, we got electronic structure that looked like this. This is the Fermi surface that we got. We started, this was uh, optimally doped BISCO. So 
TC was around 93 Kelvin, and the maximal gap was almost 40 mEV. When we expose it to ozone and heat it up, uh, we got this, and we couldn't find a gap on the Fermi surface. And there was no TC. So it looks like for the first time in history, we were able to overdope this material beyond the superconducting dome. So this was not possible before. Uh, because uh, how do you dope it? How do you overdope it? You, you push as much oxygen as, as possible. So this delta has to be large. And uh, uh, how people uh, overdoped single crystals is kind of scary. You, you fill uh, some uh, container with liquid oxygen, you dip your, your sample into that, you close it, <laughs> and you heat it to 1,000 degrees. So, and the, the most uh, oxygen that you could push in that way would give you TC of 50 Kelvin. Here, we got TC of zero, so non superconducting sample. So let me just uh, uh, introduce what, what these curves are. So, so you have uh, two copper oxide planes per unit cell. So you will have bonding and anti-bonding states, just like in uh, hydrogen molecule, and they will be split. So I'm going to have also Fermi surface corresponding to that state bonding and anti-bonding. And uh, because of mismatch uh, between uh, copper oxide and bismuth oxide planes, there is slightly mismatch in, in the lattice constant. The, the whole crystal tends to warp, and that produces this kind of one-dimensional moiré pattern. So, so there is super periodicity imposed on the, on the uh, essentially tetragonal system. So it looks like we managed to produce, uh, so, so, and this, this super periodicity gives you replica of, of these of this in uh, original surface state, oh, no surface state, uh, Fermi surfaces or states in general. Uh, so it looks like we managed to get uh, strongly overdoped non superconducting sample. So starting from from optimally doped as a starting material with ozone, we can go all the way to non superconducting, and if we anneal the same starting material in vacuum, then oxygen goes out and that uh, reduces the whole doping. So we can go to overdoped and to underdoped side of, of the phase diagram. And not only that, we can actually see these states, Fermi surfaces are so sharp that I can actually. Uh, superimpose my band, uh, tight binding calculations, and I can compare uh, compare them to, to measured. And I can actually, with great precision, measure there uh, the, the area of the Fermi surface. Area of the Fermi surface, it's a Lattinger theorem. Volume of the Fermi surface gives you the carrier concentration. So I can give you direct measure of the doping level. This is not possible by other techniques. Other techniques uh, rely on so-called uh, universal curve, universal par parabolic dome, where people measure TC, and then based on that, they say, okay, my doping level is that and that. Here in photo emission, by measuring the area of the Fermi surface, I can give you exactly number almost to, to you know, to, uh, better than 1% doping level. And, you know, instead of, of constructing phase diagram based on, on universal uh, dome, I can actually monitor prop different quantities as a function of directly measured doping level. So for example, I can, I can sit here, this is the point so-called anti-nodal point where the superconducting gap is maximal. 
or I can sit at, at this nodal point where superconducting gap is minimal, and I can measure obviously the, the doping level. I can measure TC. Uh, I can measure gap at this point. Oops. And if I do that as a function of doping, so for different doping levels, you immediately see that overdop sample doesn't have a gap. Gap is increasing as, as I move towards underdop. That, that's nothing special. That, that was known for a long time. I can also measure TC. So I can, I can create my phase diagram, my own phase diagram where I, can, I know exactly what my doping level is. And these, uh, these black uh, circles, filled ones, are my TC results. Red points are, uh, solid red points are my gap results. And I also I plotted some uh, points from, from literature. Uh, the only thing is that the universal curve has to had to be shifted by two percent, so it looks like superconducting dome is still a dome, but uh, the maximum is not at sixteen percent; it's at eighteen or maybe nineteen percent. Another very important thing is that so so this shaded area was not accessible before, and now we can study it, and in that region it looks like. Uh, uh, two delta over TC becomes relatively small. It, it comes to 4.3 value that uh, T wave BCS material should have. So it looks like the material becomes very conventional once where, when it's really overdone. I don't know what, what's happening here. Obviously, uh, two delta over uh, TC becomes much larger, and it's it's uh, this is this cannot be described by any uh, uh, mean field theory. But here, it looks like I have conventional system. And now, finally, uh, let's see what is the uh, boson that causes uh, electrons to 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 bind in, in pairs. What is the pairing mechanism in ITCs? Uh, so here, actually, it's, it's even uh, better because of what we established, we can do every, we can do the whole uh, doping dependence on a single surface. We start with non superconducting one, and then just anneal it to different temperatures and different times in vacuum. And oxygen that I overfilled the sample now is, is going out and my doping level reduces and I'm getting superconductivity. So these big symbols are uh, really just uh, one surface. That's ideal because there are no other complications. You can say, uh, Maybe I have sample to sample variation. No, here it's it's a single surface. And uh, so what what do I want to, to do now? So I start from here. So this is my uh, most overdub non superconducting sample. I can measure the whole electronic structure, not just the Fermi surface, but down to one EV below the Fermi law. And then I can uh, make this sample superconducting by annealing it in, in vacuum. And I can search for something that, that actually scales with superconductivity. Uh, before it was not, you know, you couldn't find a quantity that, that follows superconducting superconductivity, uh, nothing in the electronic structure. So this is the playbook. Start with this, anneal, and measure for every doping level, measure everything. And then search for something that, that scales with superconductivity. Uh, we already know from 
that, and this was the first thing that was observed in these materials. So we already know that if we sit at the nodal point where uh, superconductivity, where superconducting gap is zero, uh, you can reduce your TC by factor of three and nothing actually happens. You have a kink that stays at the same energy. The sample just becomes uh, more disordered. Uh, but there is no change, no real change with with uh, with uh, doping level. So then, I I wanted to see what is actually happening here, where the superconducting gap is supposed to be maximal. So how does the dispersion look along this line? It looks like this. So this is non superconducting sample no gap, nothing. The uh, experimentally derived uh, uh, dispersion is kind of monotonic, almost a straight line. So this is the tie binding calculations that I used for, uh, for Fermi surface fitting. And you can see that, that the slope, it's kind of renormalized, but, that, but there is no, no structure as it's essentially monotonic and straight line. However, when I start annealing my sample, and now uh, the sample becomes superconducting, I immediately see this superconducting gap. The, 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 the electronic state doesn't cross it, the Fermi level anymore. Uh, you can actually see this back turning, back folding of, of the band, which is essentially just Bobolubo. Uh, quasi particle dispersion. But also the most importantly, you see that, that now my dispersion acquires some kink here. So there is a kink and this kink becomes stronger and stronger. When my TC becomes 70 Kelvin, it, it's really obvious. And that indeed looks something that you had in, in the electron phonon coupling case in the Oshkrop Mehring textbook. However, when I go slightly above TC, all that structure disappears. There is no gap. Uh, there is no Bogolyubov of turning, uh, back turning of, of dispersion. And certainly there is nothing, uh, no kink left. So what's happening here? Well, I can, I can put all of these dispersions, measured dispersions on the same graph. And you can see this is my non superconducting This is uh, 38 Kelvin. This is uh, 50 Kelvin. This is 68 Kelvin. This kink, this superstructure, uh, this uh, anomaly in dispersion becomes stronger and also it shifts to, to uh, higher binding energies. I don't know what is causing this, but I, by comparing to available candidates, I can tell you which candidates are good and which are not. I cannot tell you the, the directly for, from photo emission. We just see the effects, but which excitation is causing that, uh, we don't know. We have to compare to, to candidates. So, and the, the, one of the biggest problems is that when you go from superconducting state to normal state, I completely lose this structure. So this is, this is uh, obviously you can see by, by naked eyes, uh, you don't have to do any analysis, but we can still do uh, quantitative analysis of this effect. So this is, for example, real part of the self-energy where I subtracted the tight binding dispersion from my measured dispersion, and this is what is left. So you can see that uh, uh, self-energy is becoming stronger, and this peak is becoming more prominent. And for example, I can I can do just the same thing that I did for my electron phonon coupling case. I can extract the uh, slope, low energy slope, this will give me uh, coupling strength. And if I plot it as a function of, of doping, I can see that it's essentially uh, doesn't exist 
it's it's very small at 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 the uh, when I'm superconducting when when I'm studying non superconducting sample and as superconductivity increases my coupling constant also increases this is perfect this is what you want to do you know uh, aluminum is superconducting but tc is i don't know 3 kelvin lead has much stronger coupling you can deduct it from from your stm and tc is also higher so i have something for the first time that scales with with superconductivity uh, so tc black coupling constant red you see that as you approach optimal doping this becomes 10 this is this is very very strong coupling but it's not <laughs> on phonons but you will see so how can i tell you uh, what is the involved excitation well i can compare my energy that i can observe directly with some candidates. So this is what I detected. So this is the energy of my mod. As you see, it's it's going down as TC uh, going down with the overdoping. And if this was a phonon, I should find some phonon in in a photon phonon spectrum that would do this. Uh, one of the favorite candidates. For electron phonon coupling in cuprates is so called B1G uh, phonon, but it doesn't change its energy as a function of the doping. It's just there, constant, as, as phonons should do. On the other hand, my excitation goes from, from 30 something to zero. So, what, what could it be? Definitely not phonons. The second favorite, the, the second popular candidate is a uh, so called uh, resonance mod from the uh, uh, spin fluctuation spectrum of, of these materials. So, you know, this it, it's measured in neutron scattering. You essentially see uh, our uh, hourglass dispersion with the lower branch and the upper branch, but there is this uh, strong. Uh, mode at uh, commensurate pi pi just like anti-ferromagnetic wave vector and there is a strong peak in in that spectrum uh, this has been measured in in neutron scattering and if i put the data that they had of course they cannot go all the way to this but in the re region where where we overlap in doping at least this has a good trend, you know, as you overdope more and more, this mod loses the energy. So energy becomes lower and lower. However, you can see that it's still, uh, it's at 40 milliev instead of 30. So, and this, this, my, this is my error bar and they have their own error bars. Uh, it's, it's not that. It looks, uh, more promising than phonons, but it's not that. So it's not phonons, not spin, spin resonance. Uh, what I think it could be is that first spin fluctuation spectrum excitation at slightly incommensurate. So it actually uh, cor corresponds better to, to uh, uh, my case because my state is not as exactly at pi zero point it's slightly the fermi surface is slightly off that point which means that i cannot have a uh, coupling to commensurate uh, excitation but it has to be incommensurate and also energy it's so so here you have spin gap and the first excitations are here and if i put them together this is also measured in neutral scattering you see that uh, the overlap is much better. So I think that this is actually something that uh, serves as a, a glue for coupling of two electrons in, in these materials. And it's not actually uh, only, only this particular uh, material. 
So for example, strontium rotenate has very similar uh, resonance mode, like 40 something milliEV. However, spin gap is much smaller. It's few milliEV. And indeed, TC is much lower. And also you don't see uh, sharp quasi-particle peaks in photon emission in LSEO because the, the energy of the mod is so small that you cannot actually resolve the quasi-particle peak in photon emission. Okay, so that, that's, if you have any other candidates, I would be glad to hear about it. But this is another uh, example how you can easily uh, uh, eliminate phonons. So, so this is uh, my 70 Kelvin uh, superconducting sample. You see this uh, very pronounced king. Uh, and it looks something like this, oversimplified. If I go to, to the normal state, I should still see it. The gap should be should disappear, and the king should move slightly in energy, but it should still be visible, just as in the case that I uh, showed you before, uh, calcium intercalated graphene, graphite. Uh, these data were in normal state, and you see strong uh, renormalization. You see the king even in normal state. However, here I go to the normal state and I, I don't see anything. Phonons didn't disappear. Coupling cannot disappear like that. So something has to happen to that mode that I'm, I'm uh, interacting with as I go from, from superconducting state to normal state. And indeed, uh, spin fluctuation spectrum changes strongly as I go from low temperature to high temperature. So resonant mode disappears and also gap fills in. So there is no, no spin gap. So instead of having something well-defined, now you have very broad and that can give you essentially featureless dispersion. So this is, this is what I think that it's, it's uh, serving as a glue in incorporates. Uh, one good thing that we know already is that, so what will happen if I can increase a uh, coupling constant even more? Will TC saturate or will it just disappear? So the good thing is that actually there is no strong saturation. So if we could find the material that is, that has even stronger coupling, uh, we could get higher TC. Okay, so I'm gonna skip this. Uh, so this was just a search for uh, for topological superconductivity, which is problematic. Uh, on cuprates, you cannot really induce superconductivity in topological materials that you deposit on it because everything dops, dops these interfaces with electrons and interface becomes non superconducting So this is not good. Uh, and this is essentially my conclusion. Uh, just uh, a minute of your time. So I'm really excited about uh, doing a photo emission on uh, uniaxially strained materials. So this is, for example, strontium rotinate. It's uh, fourfold symmetric. This is the Fermi surface, but when, it's, when you start stretching it or compressing, the uh, a Fermi surface becomes twofold symmetric. One, one whole singularity moves to the Fermi level and actually below the Fermi level. And at that point, TC increases by a factor of three. So if we could do the same with cuprates, and if we go from 130, we could end up <laughs> above room temperature. Of course, <laughs> this, will probably not happen to see if anything will go down, but it's exciting. Uh, we actually saw the effect not only on this, this was not our paper, 
but on some other materials. So this is a uh, superconducting and CDW material, uh, 2H niobium selenide. It it has a hexagonal symmetry in the in the relaxed state and uh, Fermi surface and the electronic structure should also be uh, six fold symmetric. However, when we applied uh, uniaxial strain along this direction, you could immediately see that uh, one of these one one hop singularities becomes closer to the Fermi level than the other. So, so this is uh, blown up uh, region one and region two. You see that here uh, the distance between uh, uh, whole pockets centered at gamma and centered at, at k points are uh, the distance is much smaller than than here. This is because of uniaxial strain. Uh, you can expect much larger change with uniaxial pressure than with with hydrostatic isotropic pressure. This is just bent structure. Uh, another uh, thing that would be nice to have in this future uh, ARPES lab would be, oops, ability to measure uh, parallel, in parallel transport and photoemission so that we can compare, you know, one to another uh, directly. And for that, you need some nice manipulator that can bring your uh, four probe or six probe uh, 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 probe to, to the uh, surface. And uh, also it would be nice to combine everything with, with the MBE synthesis. Uh, in particular, the one where you can move the mask and change the composition of, of your uh, film uh, continuously. So essentially you don't have to, you know, do what I did, anneal and then change the composition. You could have the whole phase diagram on a single sample, just moving from one side of that sample to another, you could cover the whole phase diagram. And okay, so time resolved ARPES would be also nice, but you know, <laughs> it depends what you want to do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tony, for this uh, very nice pedagogical and at the same time complex uh, talk. So time is open for questions, comments. Fred. Uh, I have two questions. The first, how you measure actually the, the, the superconducting temperature then in the system? I mean, everything depends on that your phase diagram needs the, the superconducting. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. So if I anneal my sample in vacuum, then it looks like this is uh, very homogeneous. So oxygen goes away from the sample at any depth. So it it go it it, it becomes under the uh, uniform. If I anneal my sample in, in ozone, then only uh, maybe uh, depending on time that you spend at at ozone temperature uh, at this high temperature and ozone atmosphere, uh, you can have maybe 10 micron uh, that is strongly overdoped and then it becomes actually even underdoped because most of the sample is uh, cannot react with this uh, ozone. And instead of accepting more oxygen, it uh, oxygen actually from most of the sample goes up. So the only measure of TC for that strongly uh, overdoped case is actually spectroscopy. I see where the gap closes and that's it. So you measured it by, again by the ARPES directly? Yes. Only in, so, so we, we know that by you know, exfoliating the ozonated sample uh, more than once. Once when you, uh, uh, exfoliate and cleave the sample. Additionally, you see that it's actually not overdoped. And we can measure the, the flake that we exfoliate. Uh, we can measure the uh, superconducting temperature in, in squid. And only in tiniest flakes that are actually transparent, you can see that 
PC was reduced. So on the overdub side, it's essentially spectroscopic measurement of DC. On the underdub, uh, it's it's and we can also do bulk because we can we can uh, take the sample out and we see that it, it really became uh, underdubbed the whole depth. Or questions, comments? If you just let me make a brief comment. So, if, if anyone from the online audience would like to make a question, please write that in the chat, and I will read that for for Tony. So, you're yeah, sorry. Yeah, very nice talk. So, I'm a bit surprised that actually what you were mentioning that in the normal state you don't see any king, right? Yes. But so you are these spin fluctuations you are mentioning they decay they, they decay exactly at the TC. So why this coincidence? So isn't this a bit surprising? So it really happens that this, uh, you know, there is no king exactly just above TC. Okay. Or so you really trace that? Uh, an excellent question. So what actually are these spin fluctuations? <laughs> they're, they're not uh, independent as, as, uh, as uh, phonons are, but they're actually derived from, from electronic excitations. So this is essentially two particle response function. It's it, so this resonance resonant mode was called uh, spin exciton, for example. So depending on what your electronic structure is, whether it has a gap or not, you will also have change in the uh, spin fluctuation spectrum, just because one is derived from the other. So they go together. And of course, now you can say, oh, maybe that's not, uh, that's not uh, the cause of superconductivity. It could be a consequence. And I agree. But uh, people like, uh, like uh, uh, Scalapino or Dam, they actually got this in theory. And they, they, they saw actually that you can get uh, TC from spin fluctuation. And that is that, and that spin fluctuation spectrum is actually causing uh, superconductivity. But the spin resonance mode is not the spin fluctuation, in the sense that it no. is not derived from the magnum dispersion. Sorry, it's not derived from the magnum dispersion, right? Yeah, that's why it's called spin fluctuation. It's yes. it's not it's called magnum. It's a density way more than the spin. I mean, the spin resonance mode is in the magnetic excitation out of the, 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 the condensate, right? So that's a reason it's a TS of the scene. Maybe it's, a, it's the same with neutron scattering. The, 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 the very during the Q phase, which is believed to be a, a magnetic interaction, comes from the antiferromagnetic uh, ground state of the parent compound, not insulated. And this has a, a, an energy of 200, 300 millivolts. No, I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm far away from, from, from uh, a yeah. parent compound. So I don't have magnets. Uh, the only thing that is, is left is spin fluctuations. There, are, there is no magnetic, no lo long range magnetic order. No magnets. Correct, but it's still the uh, same that paramagnets is still survive. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. This is discussed as a And they, they, they survive exactly to the point where I need them. <laughs> I see that uh, uh, they play a role all the way to very over the case where DC goes to zero. But the paramount dispersion is still visible at, at the overdose, overdose. So why yes. does it go down if the paramagnons are there? Uh, because uh, paramagnons and specifically uh, spin gap and the resonance uh, energies, they all go down. Maybe naive question. So all the spectra look like like a broad clouds, yeah. So we should have lots of experience to draw lines. It's, is it because uh, of, of physical decay? So say it's, it's, it's the width of these clouds is larger than the gap, uh, or it's because because you don't have enough resolution, for example. What what you would see uh, if, if you would measure this 
uh, spectra from aluminum or niobium or whatever, or you don't have enough resolution to detect the gap uh, in, in, in conventional circuit. Okay, so uh, for aluminum or conventional, you know, if if my gap is one millieV, okay. I will not yeah. detect it with with ten millieV resolution. So that's a resolution. Yeah. yeah. So this but is ten millieV resolution is is more than sufficient to actually. In my case, it was uh, maybe five millieV. So I had more than enough resolution to to uh, to get the gap, to get self energy, to get everything. So essentially, if you would improve your resolution, your your spectra should become more narrow. Yeah. So that's, so that's uh, well. It's not only resolution. It's it's also uh, impurities. They will broaden your spectra everywhere. It's also finite temperature. You so instead of just emitting your uh, excitations that you interact, you also have absorption that that also limits. But yeah, in principle, uh, the better, cleaner, and low temperature and better resolution that would give you a sharper. Well, spectrum. that was actually the question. So yes, this width, which you see experimentally, it's because of both resolution or because of physical. Uh, it's uh, it's combination. Because at certain point, I mean, I can I can make my. Uh, Resolution better. I can go to one milliv, but I don't see the change in in the width, which means that this width is essentially intrinsic. It's it's given by impurities and finite temperature. Okay. Any last uh, question, Sava? Okay. You were talking about uh, spin propagation uh, or paramagnons. At the same time, it is. Uh, you show the measurement from uh, neutron uh, scattering. But at the same time, Riggs shows that there are some paramagnon at the gamma point. Well, what what is your opinion about this? It goes uh, also to zero, actually. So Riggs still has uh, you know problems with resolution. Uh, but it's clear that up to, to 300, up to, okay, up to zero, it looks like the measurements. Yes. Uh, to measure 200 milliv excitation in rigs, so that's fine. Uh, and these are these excitations probably still exist because, I mean, even in in this uh, theoretical model, you know, this this is still there. It, it goes essentially. It it should go all the way to the bandwidth essentially because. It's created, see, this is maybe 40 milli AV, it goes all the way to half an AV. So that's the remnant of, of, of magnums. That's, that's you know, the, the top of, of uh, paramagnum uh, dispersion. But you do, do you know, know any preference to the gamma point or PT, pi pi point? Uh, I don't know, I mean, uh, for this problem, I didn't care about you know high high energies, but you know that uh, in photo emission you actually see uh, the normalization re renormalization of the band at Certainly. at very high energies like three four hundred milliv. So, and that is essentially visible everywhere on the Fermi surface, which means you that three hundred. Yes. Uh, well. Obviously, you cannot see it here because the bottom of the band is 100 millimeter. But if you go to the uh, nodal point, then your state disperses all the way to 1 millimeter, and you see it's called you know? waterfall here yeah. <laughs> because the dispersion goes like this and then drops. Uh, it's it's really high energy king. Uh, but you cannot explain like a figure on the left, the bottom. You can explain this waterfall. Uh, why not? No, it's it's possible to apply the same picture, like yes. in this. Yeah. In principle, yes. Yeah, I can interact with with low energy excitations, mm -hmm. or I can react with high energy excitations that are three hundred milliev below the Fermi level, but they will show up at at energies uh, deeper than that. 
Okay, so I, I, I think we could uh, finish here because Tony will be is around let's say, to to continue with the discussion. So again, thank you very much, Tony, for this uh, wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Well, <laughs> Nice to meet you, Ricardo. Very nice to meet you. So I was actually on the first yeah. 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 Yeah, so we are. Okay. Maybe I come back to you sometime. Sorry, because I know everything in Bessie's class. We do not have to anymore. I mean, I got. An email saying yeah, everything's constant. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm so busy. I'm very busy. Like next year, I have a little bit of time. I'm getting in touch with my friend, the Bobby Collar, who was responsible for you, but I'm pretty sure. That's why I gave it a great idea. I just had a good idea. I could, I had been time just one day after this thing. Internet page, you have private numbers, private emails. I was in Thank you very much. Thank you. See you next year. I hope so. Finally, answer Yes, so Sasha, it's the same. I mean, it's the state. You let have internet there. So when he finally answered, he he said that. He's looking forward to us. Okay, there. Ask, ask me again. I mean, I, yeah, if you do not have the telephone number, I give you this telephone number, but I'm pretty sure this is still in it. Sorry, I'm going to turn off. Yeah. <laughs> okay. See you then, maybe next week in Barcelona. Okay, oh, so you're going to. I'm going on oh, Sunday yeah. to Barcelona. To Boreas in my case. Mm -hmm. Okay. See you there. Hello. Hello. Hey, great. Sorry, Sorry for running. Nice Sorry for running. <laughs> no, don't worry. I mean, actually, you know, well, it's always my case. I say when I'm German because when the talk is interesting. You don't know what to do, but at the same time, I thought that uh, you know it's worth, let's say, to to, to keep yes. somehow the. So I, I recently gave similar talk in Zagreb after many years, you know. <laughs> and uh, I told him, told him, okay, I can go one hour I, or I can go two hours. <laughs> can you feel that it's enough? You just yeah, it's just, just and, and they said, no, no, just, just go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, I mean, and, and you could see that in the audience, right? I mean, when you, yeah, do you yeah. feel when you are giving a talk, you feel whether the audience is uh, yes. 
And, and this time you, you, you could feel that the elderly people were very much interested. Sleep, I so I, <laughs> and I personally, I mean, I, I love the, the way in which you, you, you made that because, you know, you start from the very beginning from, uh, let's say, relatively simple concepts of photomission and then you, you, you make it. My, my, yeah. my goal to, you know, for exactly. people that are not yeah. experts. To, to understand. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the perfect way to 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 give a seminar, and unfortunately, it's not that common, you know. So yeah. Yeah, I, I really love that. So even the experts, I, I was complaining that you know nowadays uh, interactions in all of these quantum materials are pretty tiny, and mm -hmm. uh, essentially the physics came to the point where okay, some uh, theoretician predicts. A system, somebody uh, synthesizes it and what emission measures it, and that's it. There is absolutely no follow up, which is actually worse than, than, than in the beginning, because in the beginning, you, you really needed to you know, verify your band structure calculations. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, I realized this comment that you made during the talk that, uh, I mean, you, as far as I remember, you mm -hmm. said something like that. ARPUS is becoming again the, some kind of technique just to see to use, be used as a reference to the calculation of uh, electronic yeah. bands and no more than that, right? And, and that, that's and once, really pity. I, I didn't know about this trend. Once the just, first result is out, nobody wants yeah, to, yeah. To, to measure it again yeah. because. Mm -hmm. You have to be either first or good. It's a pity. I mean, I didn't know about that. I, I, I used to work in photomission, but I'm not doing that anymore. So I'm not following the, 